and then you will run through some of the issues associated with it. How can you tell whether people are entrepreneurial or not? The impact of that in terms of the economy. And then I'm going to move on to our cluster in Cambridge and tell you something about that and how it operates in the Cambridge uh, network system. And then finally, I'm going to show you some of the work we've done to give you some idea of how you go about doing this and how what you can achieve if you really wish to. But firstly, just the outline of the talk. I say, starting off with entrepreneurship, I want to talk about, and I'm going to say you have to be passionate for this, as it says at the back there, seek success, and maybe you'll achieve it then. And then show you something about, actually, the training that we also do in terms of entrepreneurship. So it's, it's a combination of education, research and development, and then how to exploit that in the academic sector. So firstly, what is entrepreneurship? Well, it comes from a 13th century French verb, meaning to do something or to undertake. And then, it, not until the 16th century, that the noun entrepreneur had emerged to refer to someone that involved business ventures. So originally, it was just to undertake it too, and then it became a business venture in the 16th century. And then, in 1730, Richard Cantillon, who was an English economist, then introduced the idea of risk that became a risky uh, business venture. And now, if you look at the current definition, it's one who undertakes uh, innovations, finance, and business acumen in effort to create, uh, turn uh, innovation into economic goods. And that's the current definition of what I'm talking about. But if you look back, it has a long history, taking back several different centuries. So what, it, what does it require? Well, it requires passion, passion in the individual in order to actually get to a point where you want to take a risk and you want to develop something out of your own science and technology. But with that passion, which comes from the heart here, you have to have fire, which comes from your belly, and you have to have knowledge in order to do so, of course. So those three combinations, if you get that right, then you get the motivation then to be successful. And that really is all that entrepreneurship is about, having the passion to go ahead and actually do something in terms of what you actually require, you require what I call the three T's. So firstly, there's temperament there. Temperament is, comes from the mind, the, the genes, if you like. So we're talking about passion, we're talking about drive, we're talking about are you mission-oriented, what motivation, are you dedicated, and so on. All of these factors collectively are termed passion, not passion and temperament. The second thing you need is the talent. In other words, you've got to be reasonably creative under circumstances. You need to have the courage to go ahead with it. You need to have focus on your goal. You need to be resourceful. And you need to be able to spot opportunities that are arising. So temperament, talent, and then the final thing is technique. So technique is the skill set or maybe the experience that you have and how you deal with your temperament and talent. So three teams you require before you start this. Temperament, talent, technique. So why should you really be passionate about entrepreneurship as academics? Well, lots of reasons. The first one is that you may wish to make lots of money, and therefore you might have then a champagne lifestyle. Actually, if you live in Cambridge, that's about all we drink in Cambridge, so we do have that anyway. And of course, in many cases, people are interested in translating their science into something useful. In other words, for the benefit of mankind, maybe then to create employment or whatever. So by translating the useful, you can create employment and you can then feed into what is now called a knowledge-based economy. That's knowledge based on mindset, people, rather than physical assets. And of course, uh, if you can do all of that, you can create a seamless interface between academia and business. So your scientific development goes right through into commercial reality. And that really, the last one, was the motivation why I started this about 20 or 30 years ago. So in terms of the knowledge economy, there are four so-called pillars of that. Firstly, the economic and institutional regime of the country or organization. Secondly, the education and skills. This university, for example, counts as part of that. Then you have the information and communication infrastructure. And finally, you have the innovation uh, system itself which includes the companies, the universities, the think tanks, and so on, technology transfer offices, and so on. So four pillars of the economic, education, information, and innovation, which form a sort of innovation uh, uh, system of the, uh, of the country. Now, one of the 
important issue when you're setting up a startup company is to find a funding for it. It's probably the most difficult of all tasks to do. I've been doing this for a good few years now. The easiest way is to get a grant from the government or research contracts or something like that, and then you can combine that then to get the science to come a little bit further so you commercial without actually any loss of equity in the company. So it's a good thing to do. And slightly worse is to go into loans and overdraft, and there's certainly private people tell some stories about how you can get easy trouble with that, we're not careful. We deal a lot with business angels in Cambridge because there are a lot of fairly wealthy and high net worth individuals, and if you know the right ones and they invest in the company, you can get financed that way. Three F's stands for families, friends, and fools. Any idiot that will give you money, you can take it on ideally. You can move into convertible loans. These are loans given where it can either be paid as a loan or something you can work to the company. That's quite a useful, useful mechanism. Corporate contracts, corporate venture, we do a lot of this as well. Venture capital reports, and also the investment bank. As you go from here to here, the conditions associated with that get more and more obvious. And therefore, you ideally you want to be at this level, but you can So if you were to give them what we call an elevator pitch, this is a short-term pitch about the company to get the money, raise money for it. Typically, you'd only have maybe four minutes to make this pitch, it's very short period of time. You've got to cover a number of critical issues. What is your product or service? In other words, what are you going to sell at the end of the day? Who is your market? That is, who are you going to sell it to? Uh, what is your revenue model? How are you going to make money out of it? Who is behind the company? That is, who are the managers, the executives, the founders of the company. Uh, who is the competition? And people say, you know, I see this all the time, there's no competition for my product. Actually, there always is competition somewhere in the world. So therefore, we need to be clear what that is. And then, of course, if there is competition in the world, what is your competitive advantage? You know, what's your advantage of your product or service you that? So you answer those uh, six questions, and then the chances are you make so if we look at academic entrepreneurship, uh, I mentioned initially that the T's, the three T's, now I'm talking about the P's now. And the P's are, you need the passion, you need the purpose, you need the way you're going, you need the people to connect, that's the managers and the founders, you need the problem to solve, and you need the plan to actually solve that problem. Assuming you've got all of that, you then need a fair amount of patience, you need a certain amount of persistence, Definitely true. You need perspiration, and you need to put some into it. You need a bit of pain, and you get a bit of pain, and maybe a bit of politics involved as well, depending on what you're doing. If you get all that on time, then you move into the green phase, where uh, you're making profits, you have a profitable company, you have lots of profitability when you're in that stage, uh, and of course, eventually you'll get the power, and you'll also get a bit of philanthropist, so you move some of your wealth away, and that's quite a serious basis. It's worth pointing out, and I pointed this out earlier today, if you take a typical business plan established in central venture capitalists, they will look at between 500 and 600 business plans a year, 500 to 600. Of those, they will look at 50 more seriously. In other words, most of them look straight in the field. 50 seriously. Of those 50, they will look at them in front of 10. And of those 10, seven will fail, so 7% Two will be successful, but only yes. We call those the living dead. They're not dead, but they're not far off it. And one will be successful. So the going rate for high economy companies, this is a worldwide figure, is one down to around five or six hundred from the original business plan. So, you know, the chances of success are quite still really many. So, in terms of the individual entrepreneurs, and actually, when you're judging these companies, which I do a lot of now on behalf of the university, you're looking at mainly individuals. And you're saying, what sort of character do those individuals have that you would trust them with spending your money or investing your money? And these are some of the features. Actually, when you look at it, you find that most people have none of those, some have some of those, but almost nobody has all of those. And it, therefore, it comes down to a judgment call to make you think they're suitable. And I want to just then go on to the final part of this talk, which is to think about how we educate people in the concept of entrepreneurship. You can't create entrepreneurs because there's certain genetics to play on that, but you 
can act as in the toolbox in order to take that creative potential and passion and do something with it. And this is what our Masters in Bioscience Enterprise does. Uh, this is a unique course in the UK, well, it's a unique course worldwide, because it's the only one in the world that's actually established in the science department and not in the business at school. So it's unique in that sense. It was founded in 2002. It's very outward looking and industrial focused. Uh, it has covers science and technology with full integration with business innovation. And even the science and technology is actually taught with the business model in mind. In other words, it's not just straight science and technology, but actually how you can then take convert that into a business success. And if you look overall at the course, it's about 85% business and about 15% science and technology in some of the ratio. And it's very intensive for curriculum. It takes 10 months. And the students are told from the outset, forget social work, you're not going to do any, anything outside this because it's a full-time job. We do a business internship, we do a study visit to the United States and, and some of the other clusters in the world that are going around and they end up doing it at the end of it. I put this up as a typical one, this is Carrie Young, she's qualified about three years ago now. And the important thing is down here, I'm in the yellow, she's Chinese, and she wants to perform a foundation and actually uh, to change the Chinese healthcare system. I think she will actually be doing that. We have another one about two years ago. So what is for you good science? Is there some kind of 
three or maybe five specific components of good science. Students, both opportunities. Thank you very much. 